You're, you're, you're listening to the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. What's going on, everybody? I just want to wish everybody a happy new year. We have finally hit 2021, and we could put 2020 in our rearview mirror. I just want to introduce my pal, Billy from Big Belly Up Sports. What's going on? Hey, how are you, man? Thanks for having me. Jade, hello. How are you? Hey, Billy. <laughs> Jade, how's it going? It's going good. Hope everyone had a great new year. Yeah, hope you did too. So to start off, Bleacher Report had a projected top 20 list of players that they thought would be the top 20 in 2020. And I want to read off this list because it's pretty awful. So (laughs) they had at number one, Anthony Davis, two, Andrew Wiggins, three, DeMarcus Cousins, four, Kevin Durant, five, Russell Westbrook, six, Kyrie Irving, seven, Blake Griffin, eight, Steph Curry, nine, Paul George, 10, James Harden, 11, Giannis, 12, Clay, 13, Carl Anthony Towns, 14, Andre Drummond, 15, Bradley Beal, 16, John Wall, DeAndre Jordan at 17, Okafor at 18, Bender at 19, and Jalen Brown at 20. So, Jade, what are your thoughts? Man, a couple of those names in there, uh, Okafor and um, what was the other one? There's a couple that's just like, this is why you should make predictions five years in advance. Right. Like uh, Bender, Okafor and Bender, to be top 20, that's just like, wow. Really? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and there's a lot of names in there that's like, yeah, you know, you got your Paul George, your Peel, your... Uh, obviously attended Kumbo, like those are, those were obvious and some of them were going to be right. But it, that it, I, I don't love predictions for this reason because there are so many things. Andrew Wiggins is another great one. He's talented, but he's missing that something that would make him an incredible player, right? He's just never going to, I don't think he's ever going to be that dude in terms of his fight, in terms of his, fire in terms of his you know he's just he's a mild-mannered guy and great players are not generally mild-mannered the way Andrew Wiggins is so it's just I find that when these lists happen there's a lot to consider outside of stats that don't go into consideration a lot of the time or that you just can't know at the time I mean you couldn't know in 2015 that Andrew Wiggins was going to be the Andrew Wiggins of 2020. Right. Billy? Yeah, looking at this list, the biggest miss is obviously Dragon Bender, the number nine, number nineteen, the the Croatian sensation, six seven foot one, two hundred fifty pound big man that everybody thought could shoot and was going to take this league by storm as the European players start to influx into the NBA. Number four overall draft pick didn't really work out. Injury slowed him down kind of at the beginning, kind of stumped his uh, progression a little bit, uh, but. After a couple uh, nice nice games here and there, jumping around teams, found himself bas- back in Israel. The biggest hit, though, I mean, uh, Anthony Davis, the number one, pretty good prediction. He's arguably one of the top three, four players in the, in the NBA right now. And I look at a guy like DeMarcus Cousins. You know, injuries really slowed him down. Otherwise, we're talking about a guy that is a fringe top ten player, in my opinion, at the center position. But my next question is, where's LeBron James? Right. 36 years old. Uh, I mean, at 31, the way he was dominating the NBA in 2015, uh, it's a little, um, you know, lack of days ago, I think, to leave him off this list altogether, even if you did expect his age to creep up with him a little bit. And, and of course, I must add that they're missing here Luka Doncic. Not that they would have been able to see him being this dominant uh, coming into the league in 2018, uh, maybe kind of takes the place of that Dragon Bender pick, uh, the influx of the European guys. Right. Well, it's safe to say this this list did not age too well. How the hell I, I don't understand how you can make a list and not have LeBron James on it, even though it's projected five years down the road. We know how much time and effort he puts into his body year after year. So someone is gonna tell me with a straight face in twenty fifteen, when that was after his last season with Miami, I guess people would think that because that's when he had the cramps against San Antonio in the finals. So maybe you could see, oh, the injury bug comes. And then he started working with a new trainer, and they, he has a new brand. I, I, I can't think of the name off the top of my head that he that he uses that is like to, it's like more for his health or whatever. But how could you say a guy who's 
basically defeated Father Time that you cannot that you can't think of twenty better basketball players than. That's ridiculous to not have him on a top twenty list. And what the craziest part of it? The craziest part is he's still number one. He's still number one. But there are some guys that I the injury bug totally killed them. Like uh, Demarcus Cousins is an obvious one. That's basically like his talent. I think his last year with the Pelicans before he got hurt, he was like 25, 13, and 5, if I remember correctly. Guys like that. Kevin Durant, I don't know where they would think the drop-off is going to be with him because as you speak today, I believe he's 31 or 32 years of age, which at 31 or 32, you're not going to age. You're not going to get much worse. So I didn't understand the drop-off with that. Russell Russell Westbrook, there's some tough ones in there, but it just, it just shows how guys emerge, and some guys just never lived up to the hype. Giannis Antetokounmpo, that honestly, like in 2015, that is not a bad projection to have him at the 11 spot. Like, yes, he's creeped up to uh, arguably a top five player right now. I currently actually have him six, believe it or not. But that's a guy that nobody really saw take the leap that he did when he won his first MVP award. They saw star potential. They saw superstar potential. I don't think anyone saw a back-to-back MVP or putting up numbers like he has. But safe to say, this did not age too well. No, yeah, the question mark with LeBron for me also is we've seen his game make players around him better. It's not like he's an athletic guy like a Kobe Bryant or those guys that were just physically dominant athletically. His basketball mind would have would have given me a clue that he would still be one of the top NBA NBA players in five years, given the age or not, in my opinion. I mean, I think places like Bleacher Report, ESPN, too, when they make these lists, I feel like there's – intentional thought and who can we leave off or who can we rank too high to make sure there's a conversation because like I, I have mad respect for Bleacher Report it's one of my favorite sources for NBA information uh, I mean game of zones role player they're current like they're they make great content and for them to be as professional and respectable as they are to leave LeBron off I have a hard time not seeing it as being an intentional move well, I mean, if you go by history and father time, at age 36, in year 18, guys don't make it that long. The That's great Larry Bird didn't make that long. Michael Jordan didn't make it that long. Magic Johnson didn't make it uh, uh, that long. Most guys don't just don't play that long. He's defeating the odds. But I think it was clear to say in 2015, to say he wouldn't have another five years left in the league is ridiculous. Like, like 20 guys better than him. Imagine someone saying right now, John Wall is better than LeBron James right uh. now. Or Paul George, Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan, better than LeBron. Like that's who they have right here. That's yeah. how ridiculous it is. Like when you saw that, it's like I like the Anthony Davis. I think that's a good projection. The Andrew Wiggins people, people just saw his athleticism and talent. But I feel like it wasn't that hype that you saw as a number one pick, like a Kyrie Irving, or especially a LeBron, or, or other number one picks you've seen in previous drafts. I guess because it was a Cleveland Cavaliers uh, draft pick. And then they had Anthony Bennett like the year before. So it's kind of like added hype that the Cavs yeah. all of a sudden suddenly won the lottery three out of four years when LeBron happened to leave and happened to get it again the year before he hit free agency. Yeah, and two guys that really kind of slowed down. Another injury guy is Blake Griffin. You know, right. He really slowed down by having those injuries. Wasn't playing a lot of games as he, as he left the Clippers and kind of early in Detroit. Kind of the same deal. And DeAndre Jordan, another guy. These guys are in their early 30s where you would think they'd kind of be at the end of their prime, maybe t- losing a step, but still dominating and really fell off uh, off in a way that no one was probably going to predict the way they were playing in 2015. Do you think Do you think people uh, like projected this based off of an injury thing? Like with LeBron, like why would – I don't know why you would think KD would drop off. There's no reason why. Because 2015, remember, if you go back one year, he won league MVP – and that's when the conversation he got started getting compared to LeBron. So why five years down the road would he drop a few ticks when he was being compared as the best player in the league? And age what is not really a factor. If I remember correctly, Durant is 32 in year 12, if I remember correctly. So if that's the case, there's no reason why he should have any slippage. And right now, even though he's coming off an Achilles injury, I still have him to be the second best player in the league. Yeah, absolutely. This guy's mega talented. And, and at a size and, and athleticism, that's really unmatched in the NBA for what he can do. This is a seven-foot guy that plays the game like he's a six-foot-five player. And looking at this list, what did you see out of Andrew Wiggins and DeMarcus Cousins that made you think he was they were going to overtake him somehow in the back end of this decade? I just don't see it. Even though 
you know, Andrew Wiggins, like you said, the height might have been there. And DeMarcus Cousins, we saw some really talented, uh, some really good play out of him. But to pass Kevin Durant, I'm just not sure where they would be getting uh, their information uh, or watching any tape to see that kind of uh, move up or move down in KD's situation. What do you think of Russ being at number five? I mean, honestly, I, I always say he's one of the most overrated players in the NBA. He's basically he gives he gives you empty stats. He gives you empty triple doubles every single night. They don't translate to wins. He's very inefficient. Makes really poor decisions with the ball, and he's not helping your team. In 2016, though, if you do remember, there was comparisons to Steph, and people were trying to make the argument Russell Westbrook's better than Steph Curry. When they were up three one, it was a segment on First Take. I remember watching that. They said, "Is Russell Westbrook actually a better point better point guard than Steph Curry?" But I think now he's certainly dropped to. I guess he's a top tw- – Russell Westbrook's a top 20 player. I certainly would not have him top 15 right now. No way, no how. I think it's insane to compare him to staff. Like, but, I mean, your first clue was that was on first take. So <laughs> I don't rate those guys at all. But I don't think he's I, – I, like, I have a hard time calling a guy that's got four triple, triple, triple doubles to start the season empty stats because one of those stats has to be assists, which means he's facilitating for his team. One of those stats has to be rebounds, which is also, you know, helps teams. So mm-hmm. I have a hard time calling that empty stats. We've That's seen him grab extra rebounds that one of his teammates could have gotten. He kind of steals it to pad his stats. Let's not play that game. I don't think he's that guy. Yes. I don't think he's that guy at all. Yes, he is. And, and, and especially scoring the ball. He takes – he. He tries to expand his game, and he doesn't know his limits. He doesn't know what my game is and what I actually have to do. Like this past season, we saw Russell Westbrook, especially even in the bubble, in the regular season. I thought he had a really good regular season. Why? Because he played to his strength. He pushed the pace. He attacked the basket. That's his strength. Once he starts thinking he's Steph Curry, he becomes a liability of a teammate, a way more of a liability than an asset. I don't think. I don't think he thinks about. Him, I don't think he compares himself to Steph Curry. I don't think he. I don't think that's his mindset at all. I was, I, kind think, of, you know, I was just kind of using the analogy that he shoots way more than he should because he cannot shoot. He cannot hit I the mean, ball from a barn wide open. When I watch Russell Westbrook play basketball, I see him take five to seven shots a game that your high school coach would sit you on the bench and not even address you until practice tomorrow. I mean, they're just terrible shots for game situations, and I feel like sometimes he tries to take over, and we've seen it now. Stars don't want to play next to this guy, and there's a reason why, and some of those things kind of go into play, I think. You know, when you got to play team ball if you want to win, especially when he was out west. And we just didn't see him really help his team take the next step many a times when he could have. Right. And with with Steph Curry at number eight, in 2015, this is when they won their first championship, which, again, this was a time when he was getting compared to LeBron as the best player in the world. Why would he drop eight spots? Again, this is a guy that eight shouldn't really be a factor with the five years down the road. And right now I think it's very safe to say Steph Curry is a top five player in the NBA right now. Despite him getting hurt last year, despite him getting hurt last year, once he gets his groove back, the Warriors are a very thin team. But Steph is a top five player. Absolutely. We're witnessing probably the, well, not probably the best three point shooter we've ever seen. I saw a stat the other day. He's behind Reggie Miller and uh, I forget the top of the list, Ray, um, Ray Allen. However, he, those guys have played 1,300 plus games. Steph Curry's right now hitting that 700 game mark, and he's three, 400 behind the all time record at roughly just over half the games played. That's really, really impressive, and I don't see him slowing down anytime soon. These guys need Clay Thompson back, and we'll see Steph Curry back on his A game for sure. What do you guys think of Okafor being considered, like, had all the hype out of the draft, great college player, and turned out to be a complete bust? And was on this projected list to be a top twenty player right now, and now I, we- I think of players like that, and I, I I think how appropriate the word lottery is beyond just who gets the picks, right? We know it's a lottery of who's going to get first, second, but it's you're playing the lottery when you make a first pick, when you make a second pick, when you get a third overall pick. It's a crapshoot, and a few of the guys on this list fall into that idea that just because you get a high pick you're still taking a risk because you can't know how it's going to work out. Like, you know, you have your few, your LeBrons and your other high draft picks that happen to work out. But, like, there are a lot more first, second, third round, first, second, third overall draft picks that we don't know who they are a year later, two years, five years later. 
Oh, they're still in the league? Great. Anthony Bennett's a great example. And I have a special interest in him because he's Canadian, right? So that was a, a big note of interest. And then where is he now? So it's just, it really is a lottery in every sense of the word. Just because you get the first pick or the second or the third doesn't mean you're going to get a great player out of it. Just because you were top three, there's still different guys with different hypes around them. Yeah. Like, uh, a good example, even like, even like this year, like no, no one's expecting Wiseman to be a superstar. I don't think if you're going to put a top 20 list for 2025 or something, you're going to have White Weissman in the top 20. I don't think that's a, that's mean he's a second overall pick. Lamelo Ball, maybe you will put in there because of his dad. I feel like Lonzo had this ad hype as a second overall pick. Only because Lavar wanted the Lakers to draft him, and they got drafted there. I don't right. think actually people projected him to be that good. Just because you're a top three pick doesn't mean you have to have the hype to be a top twenty player in five years. Like we know in basketball, like people just don't progress the way you're used to, or like in like football, like when you get a top three pick, you kind of know what they're going to be. In Major League Baseball, a top three pick, they're going to end up going to the show and being a great player. I think NBA is more of a hit or miss. Just the play style is so different from college to the NBA where people really could just tank and not be the same guy that we thought they were. I think for Jalil Okafor too, one thing that's factored in is the Duke, uh, you know, everybody holds Duke in such a high regard and you know that that guy's been coached hard and coached well by Coach K coming out of Duke. So I feel like that might have played into a little bit of the hype and we saw him play well at Duke too. He was dominant in college. However, uh, yeah, definitely did not work out in the NBA. Dave? Yeah, it, kind of back to my my previous point, like when I feel like a lot of players that are really great in college is the idea of you're you're a big fish in a biggish pond, but when you get to the NBA, you've taken the best fish from everywhere on the planet and put them in the same little bowl, and now you have to compete. So being good in college just is not always going to translate. Is your work ethic enough to, to get you to that NBA level? Is your fire enough? Is your passion enough that you're going to put in the work on top of talent? So it's a lot of different things that have to come together that you cannot see from a college career. You can't. There are elements that you only will see in a person once they get to the NBA. You know what's also really interesting? That not only LeBron is not in this top 20 list, Kawhi Leonard is not in this top 20 list. I feel Kawhi's... Prime started in 2015, but he's coming yeah. to the finals MVP in 2014. 2015 is when he emerged to prove a great score. How could you not have Kawhi Leonard on this list? Guys like DeAndre Jordan, Okafor, Jalen Brown, Carl Anthony Towns, Andrew Drummond, all all above Kawhi Leonard. And none of those guys defend like Kawhi does. Right. And we knew Kawhi was a great defender at this point in time, too. Yeah. So he was a great defender. We knew he was a finals MVP. So you can only really expect him to get better. And when he won that finals MVP, I believe he was 22 years old. So how are you going to not expect him to get better and be a top 20 player? Between LeBron and Kawhi, and if you look at the 2020 season, those were the two best players in the league. With Katie yeah. and Steph Hurt, the two best players in the league were LeBron and Kawhi. On this list, they're not in the top 20 in projections. Now, that's a big miss on their part. On their part, I mean, if you watch Kawhi back in those days, he was a fierce defender. He wanted to guard your best player. He took guys on like Kobe on night after night and played very well in doing so. As he developed as a scorer, I just that is terrible foresight on their part to look at a 22 year old Finals MVP who wants to guard your best player and you can't find a spot in the top 20 for him. Just terrible. That's a little ridiculous. I feel like if I feel like if you actually look at this list from 2015, it's not that horrible besides missing those two guys. If you have those two guys in the top, I don't think it could be that bad. Because, again, we're looking at it from 2015. I mean, Anthony Davis, we knew what he was like, what he was going to be, and the talent he already was. People were trying to project him to be the best player in the world after 2018, which, again, is not a bad take at all. Andrew Wiggins, like, he had the hype. DeMarcus Cousins, if it wasn't for the injury bug, like, guys should have – would probably be a top 20 player without these injuries. But, I mean – Things happen, but final final thoughts to wrap it up before we switch gears? Yeah, I would just agree with you. If you dropped Okafor and um, Bender and added James and Leonard, you're pretty good. You're pretty solid on this list. And I actually think looking back at 2015, putting Giannis kind of on the fringe of the top 10 guys right behind 
Paul George, Steph Curry, James Harden, guys of that conversation, that's a pretty good projection uh, for him moving forward from that far out. We didn't expect him to put on the weight that he would and develop the way that he has. He's really turned into just a phenomenal player uh, as, as he's growing. Because James James Harden and Giannis took a way bigger leap than anyone saw coming. They were great players. And, again, that's not a bad projection in 2015. It just happened 2018 and 2019. They all of a sudden took off, which is very normal. So, in reality, without if you just add LeBron and Kawhi, this is not that terrible as a list. For a projection, obviously, it did not age very well. But, I mean, if you're going to project five years down the road, not a lot of these things are going to age well. But let's switch gears a little bit. The Los Angeles Clippers. People have been doubting them all offseason and probably this year because of the fiasco they had in the bubble, up 3-1, blowing that to the Denver Nuggets. I believe the Clippers got a lot uh, got better. They got better this offseason, and people are sleeping on them because the Lakers got a little bit better. They sold Montrezl Harrell. They added Dennis Schroeder. So with the champions getting richer and the Clippers already have the nod that they're the L.A. team in the basement, people are starting to sleep on them. But they started 4-1. They had the brutal loss when Kawhi didn't play, and they lost by 50. But are we sleeping on the Clippers? Could we see them actually upsetting the Lakers in the playoffs or even get that one seed, Jade? Um, I think there's a possibility they get the one seed, partially because LeBron doesn't care what his seeding is. He, as long as he's in the playoffs, that's the goal, right? It, he doesn't care where they land. So I think there's an argument that the Clippers could – take the one seed if they continue to play this way. I do think people are sleeping on them a little bit based mostly on recency bias. It's hard to see a team objectively with their talent when there has been so much extra stuff going on to talk about around the team, the dysfunction, the preferential treatment, all of that stuff. I think it's easy to get distracted from the fact that they are an excellent basketball team. Um, I think they're going to have a great regular season. I think they should have a great regular season. I don't know still if it comes together in the playoffs. And again, that comes down to Paul George. I I don't know if I believe he's going to show up in the playoffs when it matters. And losing 50 points without Kawhi, I mean, that to me is uh, would be a bit of a red flag if I was the Clippers organization. I obviously they're not going to win every game, but to lose by that margin when you still have a Paul George and the rest of a team that is pretty good, hopefully it's just an anomaly. But the fact that that happens would be a concern to me. Billy, yeah, it's a sell for me just for the couple points you made. They lost Montrez Harrell, the Lakers added Schroeder. So I just feel like as the season progresses, it's going to be tough to outpace the Lakers. We saw what happens without one of the big two on this team. And Paul George had a pretty poor shooting night without uh, Kawhi Leonard on the floor. So that, that brings a little bit of concern for me to Jade's point, uh, just seeing Paul George. But Paul George is a talent that should be able to carry your team to better than 27-point first half. You would think that a little bit of the leadership would come through and help these guys do it. I mean, they've got a couple savvy vets starting on this team, Nicholas Batum. He's a pretty good player. You'd think he could help out as well, uh, keep this team going. But as the season progresses, health is going to be very important. Obviously, they need Paul George and Kawhi Leonard both healthy. Or this team really is going to struggle, especially when they get to the postseason. The Clippers will get the one seed in the Western Conference. I'm very sure of that. Like like Jade said, LeBron doesn't care what seed he has in the playoffs, especially this late in his career. The reason why they got the one seed last year is because he had a chip on his shoulder. He literally had something to prove within 2018-2019 season when he got injured, had the Young Cats with the Lakers, and they missed the playoffs. There was the noise. He's washed. His championship days are over. He'll be the only superstar to never win one with L.A. The Lakers are better off trading LeBron. Love that narrative. That that another one that definitely didn't that didn't age too well. that didn't age too well. And then you get Anthony Davis, and they made sure they played just about every game and locked up that one seed, even though they really didn't need it. And this year they don't need it. They he got the hump off his back. He got the championship with the Lakers. All the Lakers need to do is focus on being healthy entering the playoffs. I don't care what seed they are. I would probably pick them to go to the Western Conference Finals and beat the Clippers. But the Clippers' sake. They have something to prove, just like the Lakers did last year. Now it's the Clippers' turn. They got to get the monkey off their back. They got to get the narrative off that they blew the 3-1 lead. So people are trying to say that. People forgot about the Clippers. If you go back a year ago, the hype around the Clippers every single night, Kawhi's the best player in the league. 
Kawhi and, and George Paul, I call him George Paul, ha, are the best wing duo since MJ and Pippen. <laughs> that, that was a good one. Too. So, <laughs> things like that is why they need something to prove. I think they're going to try to play more games. They're load managing. I don't think t- Ty Lue proves he can handle superstars and handle other stars, which is why I like the Clippers a lot this year. Will, will they upset the Lakers? Probably not. I can definitely see an upset. I'm not counting them out by any any stretch of the imagination. I could see them pushing the Lakers six or seven games. But that battle of L.A. that we wanted, I could totally see that happening. I agree. And I kind of like that Tyron Lue being in the other opposite huddle, being that he's been in the huddle with LeBron James in a lot of these situations as well. So a little bit of coaching insight. Never uh, never hurts a little bit, and you never want to count out a, a motivated Kawhi Leonard. We saw what he did and for Jade Toronto Raptors up there. When he, his mind's to it, that guy is incredible, and he can get it done by himself if he has to. The only thing with the Clippers is George Paul in the playoffs. Against the Mavs, the only reason why that series went six games is because Paul George went to George Paul to weigh off Paul, or whatever the hell they call him nowadays. That is why, <laughs> that's, why the, that's why the series went six games. Every time he struggled in the in Luca's game in game winner with no Porzingis in overtime, I think George Paul dropped nine points in a game that went to overtime. Something like that is not acceptable. And then the then the Denver series, my God, the game seven, the side of the backboard, ten points in the game. I don't think he scored in the second half. That was that was a tragedy on a basketball court. I don't know how else to put it. That's another thing. He said he's working with his trainer from 2019 when he was with OKC, finished third in league MVP voting. So, I mean, if that's the case, and again, he's off to a better start. The Clippers did not get worse from last year. They got better. Serge Ibaka, you could say, is an upgrade from Harold. You could debate that all day, and that's fine. But the biggest thing is they have something to prove. They're not going to have the special treatment, and Tyron Liu is there. That's why I think they'll be better than last year, and they will definitely. I could see them getting the one seed because I don't think the Lakers need to get it or they're going to try to push to get it. I think LeBron is going to try to coast through this season as slow and easy as possible just to have a top three, four seed. If the Lakers finish with a third seed in the West, I will not be surprised whatsoever. I definitely don't expect them to finish the first seed. If you remember last year, remember opening night when Kawhi gave LeBron the business opening night. What was the hype all around social media, all around the media, the fans? Kawhi gave it to him. He's the best player in the world. They're going to win the finals. The Clippers beat the Lakers this year. I didn't hear anything about it. It's like, yeah, the Clippers beat the Lakers. The hype around the game wasn't there. The hype around the media, the hype around hype about LeBron, Kawhi, it wasn't there. And and Kawhi did that last year without George Paul. And now Paul George was there this game, and he still threw yeah. a penalty out of bounds, but that's besides the point. It goes to show how much people are literally sleeping on the Clippers because of recency bias. And I always I make a comparison also. The 2011 Miami Heat had a similar situation, not identical, but a similar situation. Had the hype, LeBron says not five, six, seven, eight championships or whatever. He has the meltdown. The Heat lose the finals. And people thought that they, the, they were sleeping on the Heat, that Pat Riley's got to break up the team. LeBron's not a uh, a playoff performer. He's a choke artist. And then in the finals, they're literally underdogs against the Thunder for that reason because of last year. I feel like it's a similar situation with the Clippers. Obviously, talent on each roster is not the same, but in terms of narrative perspectives, yeah. I think there's some similarities to it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Like, it's and, and I think it could play into the Clippers' benefit this season that people are not talking about them. I think it's going to take off some pressure. And I think that that easing up of all that attention and all the media and all the hype might be enough to get them to come together as a team and be better than they were last season. I mean, I think it's always going to be hard to beat a LeBron team when the media is putting you head to head because LeBron just has that thing that he can will things to happen with his team, with his own performance, with people around him. And, as soon as you take that narrative away a little bit, I think it gives a team like the Clippers a little bit of breathing room to develop without that eye and without without the LeBron factor. I think that comes down a little bit when the media is not so on top of, you know, the battle of L.A. I think that's going to work in the Clippers' favor. I mean, another similar situation of people sleeping on a team, the 2018 Cleveland Cavaliers, people just remember that as LeBron having an historic playoff run and then getting swept by the Warriors. If you remember in, I think it was 
January where they really started to go downhill. LeBron had the worst box score plus minus of his entire career. They they had no chemistry. The team hated each other. They were thinking about trading LeBron. Will Kane said on national TV the Lakers need to trade LeBron. Max Kellerman said the Cavs need to trade LeBron. And then and then what happened? They they traded their pieces, got their stuff together, and people were even questioning if the Cavs would make the playoffs. That's how that's how cold of a stretch they had. I believe it was in January, right before the All Star break. And then once they hit the All Star break, they started winning a little bit more games. And then LeBron got the four seed, and he and he always said he said as long no matter what seed I'm a one seed, a four seed, an eight seed. When I come into your building for a game one, it's going to be a tough matchup. So that's why I think LeBron and the Lakers are going to take their foot off the gas. They'll probably drop a few seeds, and that's a great opportunity for the Clippers to get the one seed. And we all know in a seven-game series, if the Lakers and Clippers have the top two seeds, it doesn't matter who has home court. In reality, that's seven home games for the Lakers. Right, 100%. Really I would think great. Kawhi would prefer that, uh, you know, all the talk and all the media hype and everything else be on the other side of the hallway. I think that's the locker room. Let them cruise, get the one seed. Lakers can have all the talk and all the hype and all the all-stars and everything else. That's exactly how Kawhi wants it to shape up. Speaking, yeah. speaking of Kawhi Leonard's mentality, I always looked at Kawhi as an assassin, a killer in the clutch, cold-blooded. And then the first year he had expectations was last year. With the Raptors, the Raptors were not expected to win. In San Antonio, when he won finals MVP, he was the third option. And when even when he became the number one option in San Antonio, they still had no title expectations. But the first time there was title expectations on him, it looked like the pressure got to him. Now the pressure is not on him. He's not expected to deliver. Nobody's going to look at him any differently if they don't because last year was their window and the year they were supposed to win. So could this actually help the Clippers upset the Lakers? I think it does. I think something with Kawhi, I think he needs to have a bit of a chip. And he didn't have that last season with the Clippers because they, there was an expectation. But like when he came to Toronto, I think that chip on his shoulder, I don't think Toronto gets a championship without it. Because everyone knows that San Antonio sent into the Siberia of the NBA because they were upset with him and things didn't end well. And Kawhi's response to that was, yeah, F you. I'm going to win there. I'm going to make you all look like idiots. And I think without that chip on his shoulder, he loses something. Right. And I think that that shift in the narrative this year from – there's an there's now no expectation on you. I think that will make him a better player, right? This year than he was last year. The media narrative is like I think for him. I think every player handles it differently. Whether they put pressure on themselves or the media puts pressure on them, every player is a different scenario. I think Kawhi, the media narrative, even though he's so shy, doesn't talk a lot. I think it does really matter because, like like you said, when he went to Toronto, there was no expectations, but he had something to prove. Yeah. But it was, and then his first year with the Clippers, he had expectations, but not anything to prove. He proved yeah. what he can do. And now this year, he has something to prove, but there's no expectations. So that can help them. But I really think the X factor is George Paul. George Paul cannot perform in the playoffs. He needs to actually go to his actual name, Paul George. If he doesn't, if Kawhi doesn't have a wingman, then the Clippers have no chance whatsoever to beat to beat the Lakers. Kawhi yeah. is a great player. He will get you. He's a walking bucket. From the mid-range, three-point range, get to the rim, defend your best player, do all that. He's not going to create for your other teammates. He's not going to make everyone around him better. That's why he needs a good team around him. People can create their own shot, play make for others to actually make your team great. That's supposed to be the role of Paul George. Be yeah. your sidekick. Be someone who can create your own shot. Be clutch down the stretch. Again, the only thing I don't like about them is they don't really have – they don't have a rim protector – I guess you could call Serge Ibaka that for to go up against the Lakers with Anthony Davis, and that's the best way to contain LeBron. You can never you can never contain him. I mean, excuse me, you can never stop him, but you can contain him and slow him down a little bit with a rim protector. And they don't have a true point guard who could really play make and facilitate. That's the Clippers' two weaknesses. But it, Paul George needs to be Paul George in the playoffs, not George Paul. I definitely agree. Like you guys, your point in Toronto, it was kind of the thing when he went there, we're talking about why did he go to Toronto? You're not going to win a title in Toronto. You know, that's just, just a bad landing spot. Clippers kind of the same thing with bringing Paul George in, Doc Rivers up to everything. And uh, now, hey, Tyron Lue, we've talked, uh, we've heard Paul George talk about the way he was used uh, last season, kind of in a facet that he didn't really appreciate or think would best suited him. 
and maybe Tyron Lue can get that fixed as well and clean up some of that playoff uh, disappointment. Another another thing people are forgetting last year that people were trying to make a big deal, and I was always one saying that it's not that big of a deal. The Clippers never had a consistent starting five that they had every single night. Guys were in and out of the lineup. It's not even Kawhi and PG. It was the rest of their role players were. Pat Beverly was hurt a bunch. Lou Williams, Montrose Harrell. Guys were in and out of the lineup every single night. So if you can't build any chemistry – and then you go into a bubble with no fans, which I think absolutely killed them mentally. Like that's a that's some being in that bubble is something that's like a mental toughness thing. As fans, we may not understand what it's like to be in that resort when everything is going on in the world, and then be in a bubble locked in there, have certain protocols that you can't what you can and can't do, and you're literally just there playing basketball. It's basically eat, sleep, basketball, repeat every single day. It takes chemistry, it takes a bond to get through that postseason and be great. And I think the bubble really got the best of them. We can't play. Well, well, go, yeah, go. I think that's a really good point because when Kawhi was in Toronto, they had 22 starting lineups that season again, because of injuries. Right. But they did have that chemistry partially because Toronto's core was the same. Right. They, they, had, the same team. they had the same team partially because Nick nurse loves working with different lineups, which is not a thing you can say about a lot of NBA coaches. Most NBA coaches prefer to have consistency. Nick Nurse loves the challenge of that being able to change. So if you find yourself in that position like the Clippers were last year, and like you said, where they did have their injuries necessitated them to use a lot of different starting lineups. If you don't have a group of guys that's tight and you don't have a coach that is good and flexible and creative enough to make that work, that's going to be a really hard run for a team to have the kind of cohesiveness you need to make things work in a playoff situation. And then to be the bubble playoffs on top of it was just like another factor. That's another thing that they just were not equipped to overcome as the team they were last season. And I think they're going to take steps forward this season. I think the change in coaching, there's not going to be as much preferential treatment. I think bringing on Ibaka was brilliant because it was. Why yeah. Mr. Jabaka got tight in Toronto. And so for the team to be willing to to take Kawhi's advice and, and try and get Sir Jabaka, I think will be huge for the team's chemistry. On top of the fact that, you know, he offensively, I believe, is an upgrade on Montrez Harrell. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they them losing Harrell, like they had to get something back, and especially that it was a guy from the Lakers, too. I think the Clippers really missed out, though, getting Rajon Ronda. I think that kind of killed them. Too. Like they, they could have used just another ball handler, and especially in the playoffs, we've seen him again. He takes up his play in the postseason. Oh, he's basically a coach on the floor, high IQ, can play, make for other guys, which the Clippers are lacking. Yeah. I feel like in terms of the bubble, that's kind of what helped the Miami Heat, though. The Miami Heat, I considered a bubble team. I do not think on any stretch of the imagination they're getting back out of the East. They were a bubble team. They hit, they got hot at the right time. Guys were playing well at the right time. Ultimately, why they got out of the East. I didn't pick the Bucs. I picked the Celtics to get out of the East right before the bubble started. But I think, in reality, the Heat were a team that actually benefited from. Every team, every person, every player is going to be hurt or benefited from a change in environment with no fans, yeah. too. Because the Heat, the Heat were young. Guys like Tower Hero, Duncan Robinson. Maybe the pressure of the crowd could affect their shooting versus no crowd. It, uh, it, may, it plays a big difference. That's why people thought the Lakers were going to be hurt by it because a guy like LeBron is just never used to playing without a crowd. Since he's 16 on the cover of Sports Illustrated, playing in front of large crowds, nationally televised games, all that guy has ever had in his entire career was spotlight, spotlight, spotlight. And I believe he loves the attention as well. Let's not try to act like he doesn't like the attention, doesn't like the spotlight, and doesn't add more pressure or add more spotlight on him. All his comments that he always has, Ever since his days in South Beach, saying not five, six, seven, eight rings, oh, compared himself to Michael Jordan, said that he's chasing the ghost, said that what motivates him is to be the greatest player of all time. So he adds that pressure on him. People thought that being in the bubble was actually going to hurt him, not having the crowd behind him, which I kind of thought would too. But I guess he's just so used to, so accustomed to playing basketball. He knew how to got the, get the troops together and proceed through this bubble, which they basically cruised to the, through these playoffs. Yeah. All right, um, that's going to wrap up our NBA segment for today. Jade, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Stick around.
We got one more guest coming on. Chuck, what's going on, bro? Not much. Happy New Year, guys. How are you? Happy New Year. So with the NFL season wrapping up this Sunday, who has the most to prove in Week 17? Chuck? Um, Right off the bat, I'm going to go with Tua. Uh, he's played pretty, you know, I don't want to say bad, but he's underperformed to what expectations were when the Dolphins drafted him. And I think by now he should have been that guy. I think he took over this starting job, uh, not early in the season, but kind of before the halfway point. So I think by now he should have, you know, started to gel in with the offense. But twice so far, he's been benched in favor of Ryan Fitzpatrick. Now, you know, he now... As a rookie quarterback, you can go out there knowing that, God forbid, you know, you underperform once again. You have somebody that can come in and basically clean up the mess. But Ryan Fitzpatrick tested for COVID. So Ryan Fitzpatrick is not playing t- uh, not tomorrow, Sunday. So right. he needs to go out there and do what he's done throughout his whole career, which is win. That's how you build your name for yourself. That's how you get recognition, popularity by winning. Nobody remembers you for, you know, just putting up a bunch of stats and always losing. The key is to win, and that's how you win over fans. So if the Dolphins want to make the playoffs, they've had a tremendous year. They're probably going to go um, 11-5 maybe 10-6, and six. they need to win to get in. I believe they have the best odds of, out of all five teams that are 10-5. and five. So they don't necessarily have to win, but their easiest way to get in is to just simply win. So the two needs to go out there, shut up all the critics, because now you're hearing the whispers of, should the Dolphins have taken Justin Herbert? And the Dolphins might have a top five pick in the in the draft this year. So do the Dolphins take a quarterback and get rid of Tua, kind of like what the Cardinals did with the whole Rosen, uh, Kyler Murray situation. So I think Tua has a lot of pressure going into this game Sunday. Billy? Yeah, for me, the biggest guy is Baker Mayfield. Cleveland's first 10 win season since 2007. Uh, winning their in against a uh, Pittsburgh team who's playing without their big guy, Big Ben. And this this is a Pittsburgh team that's really stumbling into the playoffs as we see it anyway. They got jumped on by the Colts last week, had a great comeback, but they've been playing abysmal down, down the back stretch of this season. If Baker can't get it done, finally with the head coach who gets the Pittsburgh team, that's basically giving them a get-out-of-jail-free card, not playing Ben Roethlisberger and not trying to keep their division rival out of the playoffs, then I'm not sure when he does get it done. It's Baker Mayfield, and it's not even close. I can't say Tua right now. The Dolphins had no expectations this year, and a rookie quarterback is not going to have a lot of expectations to deliver. Tua having that brutal hip injury at Alabama, people were dropping his draft stock because he didn't know how he's going to recover. I think already in year one, he's exceeded expectations. I don't like how sometimes he does get benched for fits. I think that's terrible for him mentally as a young kid. But the pressure is 100% on Baker Mayfield. There is too much talent around Baker for him not to be in in the MVP conversation. I'm sorry I call him a bust already. I'm very confident calling him a bust already. Being the number one overall pick, everywhere you look on that team, they are stacked. There is no reason why he should. He should be better than he is. He's still a turnover machine. He's very inconsistent. And like Billy said, their division rival Steelers with Mason Rudolph starting at quarterback – are handing the Browns a win. They were handed a, a, a win last week against the Jets, even though they had guys out. I understand that. But they blew that opportunity. The Browns are a dysfunctional franchise, probably the bottom two or three franchises in the NFL in the last 50 years, with the Jets and probably the Jaguars, if I, if I remember correctly. I mean, if there's anyone else that's worse, but that's beside the point. The Browns haven't made the playoffs since the bubonic plague pandemic in like 1400 BC or whenever that was. If the Browns somehow find a way to lose and not make the playoffs, what that would mean for Cleveland, Ohio and the franchise and Baker Mayfield, I'm serious. If, the, if Baker fails on Sunday and on the Browns, I'm ready to move on from him. That's how quick of a trigger I have with them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this, last week, like you said, he's down some po- down some guys, and we'll, we'll give him credit for that. But we've seen the Steelers be able to be had in their passing game and the running game by different teams and spots this year, even though it's a really formidable defense. But they need to get in the, to the playoffs healthy, and I don't see them playing a whole lot of the guys that matter. And if the Cleveland Browns just play this game smart, hand the ball off to Nick Chubb, use Kareem Hunt in certain situations, and use Jarvis Lander to move the sticks, Austin Hooper's not a bad player, but we've seen him be hit or miss all season long. Get him holes. Find ways to get him and move the change. 
hold on to the ball, and just win this thing. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be complicated. The Steelers are letting you get in the playoffs. Go get it done. In the words of Al Davis, just win, baby. Just win, baby. Yeah, and I think another player that's under a lot of pressure, too, is Mitchell Trubisky. He's playing for a job basically. And Mitchell Trubisky has been under the microscope ever since Patrick Mahomes became Patrick Mahomes. Because the, Bears traded, up, because the Bears traded up to take him and, instead of Patrick Mahomes. So I think Trubisky is under a lot of pressure. He has played well of late and he's gotten the Bears right into the playoff hunt. And the Bears, just like the Dolphins and the Browns, are in a win and in situation. Now the Bears have a much tougher opponent, but how great would it be for Trubisky to go up against Aaron Rodgers and beat him to make the playoffs, a one-seeded Packers team, and make the playoffs. I think that would be exceptional. And not only is Trubisky under a lot of pressure, I think his head coach is under a lot of pressure because Matt Nagy was the one who benched Trubisky when the Bears were 3-0. and And ever since Nick Foles took over, the Bears didn't really see much of an improvement. They play a lot better under Trubisky because he moves the pocket. Foles, Brandon, like you say, about Big Ben is a tin man in the pocket. The guy does not move. He's not mobile. So yeah. Trubisky helps that offensive line. So if the Bears could get a big win tomorrow, Trubisky could hold on to his future in Chicago. The, th- the thing why I don't want to say Trubisky, I agree with the coach. I'm not going to disagree with the coach having pressure. Mitch Trubisky, I think, again, he's labeled as a bust. The second overall pick, and then Deshaun Watson goes after you, and then the greatest player in the game, Patrick Mahomes, goes after him. So at that point, and the Bears moved up to get Trubisky. The fact that he's been in and out of that starting lineup, sure he has to prove about keeping a job. He's not fighting for a legacy or something to prove about his greatness like a Baker Mayfield does or even Tua to an extent. Mitch is, we've seen what Mitch is, and he's not a very good quarterback in this league. And honestly, if you're going to ask me, a borderline starting caliber player in the league. But if we we're going to take one player, I don't think anyone who has more to prove and is under more pressure than Baker Mayfield. It's, it's basically handed on a silver platter. Because it's the second week in a row now. The second week in a row, a, a win is handed on a silver platter to clinch the playoffs. If he can't get it done, the Browns might as well move on. You have the best running back tool. You've got a great receiver in Jarvis Landry. I understand the loss of Odell Beckham was very crucial. you got a new cro- coach. Freddie Kitchens is out. The defense has shown spurts of being very good. They're talented, but they're not as good as they are playing as they are on paper. But Baker Mayfield needs to be better with the talent around him. I don't, I don't think there's any excuses for him. Yes. Yeah, spe- speaking of wins on a, on a silver platter, I think the Colts are under a lot of pressure as well. They just blew a big lead to Pittsburgh. And as of right now, they're on the outside looking in. And they're going up against a Jaguars team wh- who has clinched to number one seed. So Jacksonville doesn't really have to, you know, lay down and tank for Trevor because they're going to get Trevor. So the Jaguars might come out and actually play ball. Now, I know, uh, I believe Chalk's ruled out. Robinson is ruled out. I don't even know if Minshew's going to play, but these guys are playing for their jobs for next year, and Doug Marone is probably, you know, coaching for his next head coaching gig or or as a coordinator or whatever you want to say. So I think the Colts are in a lot of pressure because now they need to bounce back. They also need help, but they need to go and win. And for them to go out in the offseason and get a – not even a journey, a Hall of Fame quarterback in Phillip Rivers – Probably borderline, but but I, I I personally think he gets in for them to bring him in and then not make the playoffs. I, I think I, I think that's a very bad look for their franchise. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. So if they're in a situation where they have a chance to still win this division, the Houston Texans are are they're they're a great team to beat a guy beat a Tennessee team if you need help winning that division. They took the Titans to overtime in Tennessee several weeks ago. So the Colts must win if they can't get it done against this Jags team after their colossal breakdown on defense, which has been this team's strength all season long. And they got bigger issues than just Phillip Rivers. And you might have to start pointing some fingers at Frank Wright. Why are the Colts under pressure when they're playing a 1-14 team and they're going to cruise and beat them? Hold on. A thing about locking up the number one pick. Players don't go out there and try to lose regardless of the situation. The Jets went out there and tried to win because every single player – is again, they're playing for something to prove, playing for contracts, playing for jobs. So they're going to go out and try to win and play hard. They don't really care about the number one overall pick because people, in reality, and you can say this is right or wrong, but people put themselves before you put your team. 
So I'm not going to say that the Jaguars are just going to play hard because they locked up the number one overall pick. As fans, like as Jets fans that we are, yeah, we want that we wanted the Jets to lose, and we'd say, yeah, lose on purpose. But there's other guys who are playing for their careers, playing for their contracts. A guy like Frank Gore, at the end of his career, he doesn't want to go out uh, being on an 0 16 team. Of course he's going to want to win. Sam Darnold, if he's going to maybe, if he could stay, win a few games, he gets an extension. He doesn't want to have to risk being a journeyman, going on another team, being a backup quarterback. He has a starting job in a big market, and after this season, the Jets would need to pay him if they're going to want to keep him. So he, he's another guy who needs to go out and play hard and try to win. So you can't always have the narrative that teams are going to try to lose on purpose just because of the number one pick. Maybe the co- maybe an ownership could kind of do that. You could finagle that a little bit, but I don't think that guys are going to go out there trying to lose or let guys go by when it, it looks bad on them when they don't play well. So that's why I really don't oh, – I never really bought into the whole tank. I never bought into the tanking thing in terms of players as an individual. I, I obviously buy into the tanking as owners, like rebuilding your roster, selling all your good players, getting as many draft picks, getting as many young assets as possible. But I just don't think players are going to try to lose on purpose. So that's why I don't like the Colts argument. The Jags have definitely tried to tank, benching Minshew so that they can they can play these other quarterbacks. I mean, come on now, that that's definitely not uh, anything that bodes well uh, with Mike Glennon under center. I mean, what are you really trying to do with that? It's not win if you're playing Mike Glennon. However, here's the one interesting thing you said: Why are the Colts under pressure? Because this Jags is a one-win football team, and they beat the Colts week one. That's their only win. So this is the only pregame talk that this team can have. And said, "Hey, we got them last time, guys. All that defense, all that talent on the other side. Philip Rivers. Who cares? We got them. Let's go get them again." Division rivals. I don't see why they think they can't win. And I do think they will be playing hard. Uh, you could say they're playing hard, but I don't, that's not the re- I don't think that's the reason why. Like this, like this, the Brown. I think the, I always, think the, I just think the Browns are under way more pressure, and especially Baker Mayfield. Given it's your division rival, it's still a good football team, but they're resting their best quarterback, and that franchise is such a dysfunctional franchise that there's already more added pressure on how bad the fans want it. The city of Cleveland cares about football way more than any any other sport. As great as LeBron's been with Cleveland, delivering that championship, the three to one comeback. Cleveland, Ohio, rather see the Browns win a title, a Super Bowl rather, than the Cleveland Cavaliers or the Cleveland Indians, even though the Indians blew a 3-1 lead. It's not the same. Football is Cleveland, Ohio's number one sport. So for your number one overall pick to really blow this two weeks in a row, I'm serious. I'm telling you right now, I I would be told – if I'm the Browns, I would say we got to move on. He should be better than Lewis. There's no reason why he's not better with that much talent around him. They have no weaknesses offensively, none. Offensive line's great. They drafted a left tackle, I believe. Traded for Austin Hooper. When they're healthy, they have Odell Jarvis Landry, the best running back duo in the league by a wide margin. It's basically him turning the ball over and being inconsistent why this team isn't better than they, than they are in reality. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we saw Baker really start to take those steps right before the COVID issue, and I really like Kevin Stefanski in this offense. I really liked him coming in, coming off the play action of what he did in Minnesota. I mean, he did it with Kirk Cousins. If he can't get it done with Baker Mayfield, that's a really bad uh, hint at what we have in this guy, and we might be leaning towards what you're saying, Brandon, and him being more of a bust, even though we've seen some flashes. What, what do you guys think about Lamar Jackson and the Ravens having pressure on them, going against the Bengals on the road? Before you go real quick, if we're looking at entering the season this year, there were predictions the Rams were going to go 16-0. and People <laughs> told me that Lamar Jackson was the best player in the league, not quarterback, player. And then now they're on the brink of not even making the playoffs. And Lamar still's got to get the monkey off his back to win a playoff team. So the, the Ravens losing to the Bengals, who are struggling all year long, and don't make the playoffs after all that? The reason why I don't bring up the Ravens as much is because I think that most of the hype before the season was from the media. I think it's because, you know, Lamar was coming off the MVP season. They were the one seed. They were the favorites, the whole nine yards. We saw in the in the divisional round matchup against the Titans, Lamar got exposed, and Mike Vrabel showed us the blueprint of how to go out and beat Lamar Jackson. And I think teams started to see the film and whatnot and how to defeat and how to stop this Ravens offense. Now, Greg Roman, their offensive coordinator, I don't think he's done as much of a, of a good job this year as he did last year. 
And, you know, coming into the season, he was one of the front runners for the next big head coaching gig, you know, offensive coordinator to head coach. But those talks have quieted down. And the Ravens, you know, early on in the season, they didn't look like themselves from last year. Now, Lamar got COVID, and then he still slumped a little bit. But he has played better over the past month or so. So they are playing red-hot football. So I don't think that's why – they being they're being talked about into that pressure situation because when you're hot you're hot so everyone expects the Ravens to go in to go up against Cincinnati and and beat them especially without Burrow and all the injuries other injuries that the Bengals have so I I'm not really even worried about the Ravens winning because uh, losing because I think they're pretty much a shoe in to to win on Sunday you can't say that because we're, we're taking down memory lane real quick the New York Jets in twenty in twenty fifteen. They were hot yeah. going into week 17 at Buffalo. Week 16, the famous yeah. Eric Decker, the famous Matt Slater coin. coin right. Slater. But, but the difference with the Jets of that year was they had that really big win against New England the week before. And usually what happens is when you have an emotional week, and not not emotion and an emotional win that next week you're you're like doomed to like fail and come back to earth it happens in sports all the time and the jets really didn't get up for that game and i think it goes on to rex ryan he he didn't have his guys get up for that game and you saw it because they put up a stinker in buffalo and we all remember it very clearly now i think john harbaugh is in a completely different atmosphere than rex ryan he's a super bowl winning coach. Coach. rex ryan's the coach of the gold man no, when, when the Jets lost? Yeah, Rex Ryan was the coach of the Bills. No. Yes. Even so, Todd Bowles even stinks. Listen, listen, I've hated every Jets coach since Eric Mangini. I, I believe so. I mean, Rex was all right the first couple of seasons. Then I'm he fell sure. apart. Todd Bowles was terrible. And I don't even have to get into what, what Adam Gase is. Yeah, but that's, no, that's the problem. problem. It was Rex Ryan. The only thing I didn't like him is he always he built the narrative of babying and trying to protect Sanchez, which was the biggest right. problem. He built the narrative that ground and pound play defense, keep the ball out of Sanchez's hands, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, play defense. I think right there, I think he was never a good offensive coach to develop a quarterback, which kind of ruined Sanchez. People are high. People are really high on him. The Sanchez really high on him coming out of the draft. But I think Rex Ryan killed him a little bit that way. But I think defensively he was excellent. Yeah. yeah. So for, me, for me with the Ravens coming into this season, I expect a little bit of regression because we've seen it out of Greg Roman everywhere he's been. Year two in a Greg Roman offense is not as productive as it is that first year. He always seems to kind of take over a team, turn their running game into something special, and regress just slightly. However, uh, you know, to your point that they've been playing really well over the last month, Marquise Brown's finally getting in the end zone. But if you look at the teams that they've played, they've played some really pathetic pass defenses. And Cincinnati's kind of always been a thorn in the Ravens' side, and A.J. Green always gets something done against them, regardless of how good that defense has been. And Brandon Allen has two consecutive games with over 65% completions, which is much more than we expected of that guy. And he's got weapons around him to spread it around. And Giovanni Bernard and Samante Pirine flashing out of the backfield, really getting some things going in that offense where it's not all on the back of quarterback shoulders. I think the Ravens could be more trouble than they would seem looking at it on paper. I think the Ravens are on break for an epic failure and an epic collapse. You have the momentum, you feel good, and then to lay an egg week 17 to miss the playoffs that way, one of these 10-5 and five teams are not making the playoffs. This is yeah, a, this crazy. Is a, for the, end, the reigning MVP who – they told me was the best player in the game to miss the playoffs now and lose to the Bengals in week 17 division rival on the road. I would put, I would put, I'll put Lamar Jackson second under most pressure behind Baker Mayfield entering this Sunday. If we're going to ask me. And it's all shoulders in Baltimore too. I mean, he's really the catalyst for this team. When we've seen him play well, this offense really hums. We, he regresses or he stays in the pocket. You make him pull the ball downfield. He's really pedestrian when you make them play that kind of football. Right. Charles. Yeah. Well, what I think the Ravens need to do is they need to get their playmakers involved early. They need to start feeding the ball to Mark Andrews, who's probably a top three, four tight end in the league. They need to get the ground game going with Dobbins and Gus Edwards and maybe a little bit of Mark Ingram. And I think the Ravens are at their best when they can get out to that early lead because then 
because then they could unleash the running game. And once you got Lamar running uh, the RPOs and everything, that's when the Ravens are at their peak. So they need to jump out to an early lead. And I believe the game's on the road, and I know there's no fans or anything. So I think getting out to a big lead early on to a team that only has three or four wins will be the key. Well, three out of three of these ten and five teams will get in the playoffs. So I ask, between the Dolphins, the Ravens, the Browns, and the Colts, which one of those teams, if not more, could be the figuratively wild card team to make a run and potentially get to the Super Bowl? Oof. Mm. Or, or I don't even really have a fighter's chance to begin with. I think the Ravens. Why? No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think the Colts have an opportunity just strictly on their defense and the, and how Jonathan Taylor has emerged. I think that gives them a really good shot at winning some games in the playoffs. And I really do believe that the Titans are going to lose to Houston this week and give them that home playoff game to help them get a little bit deeper than one might expect. Charlie? I'm going to say the Ravens just because I like how they're made up. They have a strong defense, a good run game, uh, good coaching, so, and they were, you know, the number one seed last year. So, no, not, not were they the number one or the number two seed behind Kansas City? They were the one. Okay, yeah, right. So, they were the one seed. So, I think this this team, you know, they, they, they faltered a little bit this year, but I still think out of all the other teams, I think they have the least weaknesses, if that makes any sense uh, grammatically. But, you know, you could poke holes in the Dolphins and look right away at their quarterback and skill positions on offense. The Colts, I do like, but I just don't like Frank Wright. I think he's done a good job this year, but I think the Colts had more expectations than than what they're showing us on the field. And Phillip Rivers is, you know, a known choke artist when it comes to the postseason. We've seen it over and over again during his time in San Diego. And at this rate, because – uh, throwing the ball downfield is is not one of his, you know, good features about him. So Phil Brewer struggles with that. And then the Browns are the Browns. If the Browns lose Sunday, will I be surprised? Absolutely not. Because like Brandon said, they're, they're the, a dysfunctional franchise. Just like how we thought the Jets would not go 0-16, win the game, and screw up their chances for Trevor. That's the, the, the oh. same thing for the Browns. They're going to go out, lose the game, and miss the playoffs because they're the damn Browns. Right. So here's the thing. I don't think any of these teams really have a chance to make a run to literally make the Super Bowl. Number one, if I had to pick, I'll say the Colts and I'll get to that. Number one, the Dolphins who are sitting at the five seed right now. Again, experience is going to kill them. Having Switching your quarterbacks does not work in this league. I guess you could make the argument for the 2015 Denver Broncos. I think that was a unique situation with the best defense we've seen in years, one of the best of my lifetime at least. But – to uh, you can't you know you can't have expectations of him to deliver. I'm not I'm not putting my money on Tua Tagovailoa to go into three straight games on the road and come out with victory as great as their defense may be. The Baltimore Ravens, I do not believe Lamar Jackson's game is built to win a playoff game. I think he still's got that monkey off his back. I still think that stands today. There's no because if any if the Ravens go down early or go down quick, they're they're done. You cannot trust Lamar to throw you back in games like other quarterbacks can. You cannot tell me that Lamar Jackson is going to outdo well, a Josh Allen or even, even a Pat Mahomes, of course. And then the Browns, the Browns are just one of those franchises, which is why I compare them to the 2010 Jets. When you are just a dysfunctional franchise, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Along the lines, as hot as the Browns may get, as great as they may look, something will happen where they will lose. I don't know. I don't know what will. I don't know what will happen. The Browns will find some way to lose because that's the franchise they are. Again, the defense has been inconsistent. Running game is phenomenal. Baker Mayfield is just so inconsistent. Again, I don't trust him to go to straight uh, game and, and win on the road. That's the one. And then the Indianapolis Colts, why I like them a little bit more than all the other wild card teams. Experienced quarterback in Phillip Rivers, who has something to prove because people doubted him his entire career. Think his career is a failure. He's in the conversation, I guess, to make the whole thing. He needs to get that off the board, and if he can pull something magical this season, that would be something to definitely get him in the whole thing. I'm a huge Jonathan Taylor fan. What he did at Wisconsin last year, he was he was a, he was a cheat coach for Wisconsin. He was a, a, a huge security blanket for quarterback Jack Cohen. My high school played against him. Just to make sure that. 
right? Jonathan Taylor is emerging as a top running back. I think he will. Is he going to be a Nick Club in the like a second round pick? Probably not. But again, a great defense. I will always feel confident flying and be and on a great defense, which we we'll absolutely have. So if I had to pick one of these teams, it probably would be the Indianapolis Colts. But in the end, I don't see any of these teams being able to go into Arrowhead and beating Mahomes, Andy Reid, and the Kansas City Chiefs. And the Bills are red hot. So I cannot say that the Bills are going to get beat by anyone else other than the Chiefs. The only thing that scares me about the Chiefs, why they could get up, uh, get uh, get upset it, Mahomes is going to have three weeks off because from what I know, he's not playing in week 17. And then people are just – it's going to be an expectation. Be a little shocked a little bit. And the Chiefs haven't been playing like we know the Chiefs have. Mahomes has struggled a little bit to his standards, struggled a little bit more than we're used to him seeing. When the Bills, on the other hand, are red hot. They, I think they won one of their last ten games, and the one game they lost is the DeAndre Hopkins triple team Megatron 2.0 miracle Hail Mary. So with, the, with that being said, the Bills and the Chiefs should be the top two. I can't see them losing anyone else besides themselves. Yeah, I'm with you there. This Bills team is just they look incredible right now. Going into Foxborough, that was a statement that they made uh, in, in against the Patriots last week, putting the whole AFC on notice. And one thing about them, I think they match up well with the Chiefs simply because Josh Allen is getting out of the pocket and making some similar type of plays to what we see Mahomes do and kill so many teams across the league. I'm concerned with Kansas City is that their running game has not been there. And in the playoffs, we've seen teams that can throw the ball all over the yard, get into the playoffs, need to run the ball and have inability to throw the way they typically would in the regular season. And their defense can be had as well. And Buffalo's really, their defense is coming on, playing a little bit better. And I, I just think Buffalo in Kansas City, if Tyreek Hill's hamstring is an actual issue and not just something to put on the uh, injury report for a reason to keep him out of the rest, that could be a real concern when it gets cold. Now that could change a lot of things. Tyreek Hill's hamstring going. Because the thing that makes the Chiefs offense so dynamic outside of obviously Pat Mahomes, if you can't, it's hard to double Tyreek and Travis Kelsey. Usually whoever has the one-on-one matchup is going to And the way Mahomes expects the place is getting them open. For pe- people cannot guard Tyreek Hill for 10 seconds. Cannot guard Travis Kelsey for 10 seconds. The way Mahomes extends plays, he literally has 10 seconds to throw. That's why an injury of Tyreek Hill would be so crucial. Because between those two studs, they're virtually in, impossible to beat, which is why I kind of compare the Chiefs to the Golden State Warriors of the Kevin Durant Golden State Warrior days. That's kind of why I feel like there's some comparisons there. But at the end, the Bills are hot, and if there is a team to beat the Chiefs, I guess I would try to give it to the Bills. I don't think it's the Steelers, and if all any of the wild card teams, it would be the Colts. The other teams, they don't have a shot. The Ravens are too are too young, too experienced. Lamar Jackson is not a playoff quarterback. Too young, too experienced. The Cleveland Browns are the Cleveland Browns. They just punch the no, no, I really think it's the best in the chief. It's one of those two. Charles? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I, I think I have the uh, out of the wild card teams. We're going to stick with the Ravens. If we want to look at the, the divisional teams, I think you got to automatically say Buffalo because of the way that they played lately. The offense is looking good. Um, Allen and Diggs is probably a top three uh, QB wide receiver combo in the league right now. And I do think where Buffalo might falter is with their pass rush. I think the only way you're going to beat the Chiefs is by getting to Patrick Mahomes and sacking him and, you know, hitting him and kind of like throwing him off his game where where he doesn't think he can roll out of the pocket, which is something you just talked about, extending plays. Uh, Pittsburgh I do like, but I think – the injuries are going to hurt them too much at, at the end, at the end of the day. I think Ben's knee is acting up. Uh, the elbow is probably going to start to hurt him coming off Tommy John. Um, they lost two big guys in the middle in Bud Dupree and uh, Devin Bush. So I think the injuries are going to start to show to show face once uh, Pittsburgh gets deeper into the playoffs, especially if they have to go up into Buffalo and play the Bills. Um, depending on if they make it out of the wild card weekend. And then for Tennessee, I really like Tennessee. I really do, really do, really do. Um, but the problem with them is that their defense has been poor all season and has cost them in multiple games, multiple, multiple, multiple games. Um, I really like the offensive coordinator, Arthur Smith. I really hope the Jets sign him to be their next head coach because that team can put up points led by Ryan Tannehill. I believe they were the number one scoring offense this year. 
So, I, and I think the Chiefs are a team that if they get a lead, you know, late in the game, they could run the ball with ease with Derrick Henry to kind of seal it and pull it, put it away. So, I don't think that the Titans are like one of the favorites. I would still put Buffalo ahead of them, but Titans are a really like dark horse team in the in thing, the, the thing with the Titans, their path to victory is get up early and stay ahead. If they're going to try to play catch up, they have no fighter shot. If you can keep their defense off the field for as long as possible, Derek Henry's, I, I believe Derek Henry is literally a cheat coach. He's the best running back in the league by a wide margin. They're not, I guess Nick Chubb would be a distant second. If you, if you even want to say that. So with the Titans, when you, when they get up early and you could go behind Derrick Henry, it opens up things for Ryan Tannehill. People are trying to say Ryan Tannehill should be in the MVP, MVP conversation. No, he shouldn't. That offense is so great, and it's all made up behind Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry is opening up everything for that offense. He creates the play action for Tannehill, creates A.J. Brown to get open, creates separation. Things like that is why the Titans have been so good this year. Their defense has been their Achilles heel, which I'm not. A, I'm never been a believer. I've never been, never will. I think that is a poor defense. I'll never put my money or ever bank or ever pick them to be successful and win championships. I don't. That's why I'm not – so sold on the Titans. The Bills are just hot right now, not even between the combination of Josh Allen to Stephon Diggs. Their defense shown flashes of being really good. I think there needs to just be a little more consistency of that. And a sport like football, which is similar to baseball, the hot team are the teams that are going to be dangerous entering the playoffs. Teams that are limping in, who are like the Steelers are a perfect example. Limping into the playoffs, not necessarily always health, but just winning. They lost three out of the last four games. With that being said, Going into the playoffs, there's no confidence, there's no momentum. That's a team you could see get upset real quick. And it's different than NBA when even if you're struggling in the regular season, entering the postseason, the postseason's a different mindset. The team with more talent is going to win a seven-game series. This is Sunday on any, on any given Sunday. Anybody could beat anybody. So that's why I really like the Bills. I just have too many question marks. And they have to go. They have to win by a certain play style, which is get up or stay ahead early. I don't think they can beat the Chiefs because you can't – because the way to beat the Chiefs is beat them what they're really good at and beating them in a shootout, and I don't think that's the fight to beat them in a shootout. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Like on the hotness, Buffalo's as hot as it gets right now, and I don't think there's a single team in the AFC, including Kansas City, that wants to be getting off the bus, walking into a stadium, feeling confident that they're going to play and beat Buffalo right now. And to your point about the Titans, I feel like we've seen what happens to them when they get in situations where they have to abandon the play action, where the run isn't – when they're down and they're not able to just run the ball, run the ball, play action, take shots with Tannehill. Yeah, he fits in that offense really, really well. However, Green Bay exposed them last week that if you can jump on them early, their offensive line is not built to stop the team. They just settle into a pass rush and go get in Tannehill's face. And Kansas City – uh, Buffalo, Baltimore, uh, even Pittsburgh, if they're firing all cylinders, are all teams that can hang in a hurry and take you out of that ability to sit back in I formation and just pound it with Derrick Henry. Right. Charlie, final thoughts before we move on? Um, I think one person that we're not talking about that has, you know, something to prove Sunday going over to the NFC is Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, he was brought in. He was like this coach that everybody wanted because, you know, he basically molded Patrick Mahomes in college. And, you know, the, the Cardinals started off hot this year and then they went flat. And I think if it wasn't for um, the Hale Murray game, they would have lost like five in a row. And we would not be sitting here right now saying that they need to win and need help to get into the playoffs. They would be eliminated. So I think Kingsbury has to put his best game plan forward. Um, so, sometimes throughout the season, I really wonder, like, what are the Cardinals doing on offense? And they have weapons. They have DeAndre Hopkins. They have uh, Kyler Murray. They have Kenyon Drake, who ran for a billion yards once he once he got to Arizona. Uh, Chase Edmonds, Christian Kirk. They have Larry Fitzgerald, Hall of Famer. So I really wonder, why do the Cardinals have trouble at times? And I don't think – Cliff Kingsbury is a very good head coach. He might be a great offensive coordinator, but as the man who runs the show, uh, he's coming up a bit short. So I think he needs to go out there Sunday. They're playing against a team with a backup quarterback that's lost two in a row. One of them is to our Jets, Brandon. So I think he needs to go out there and show, hey, like I could still be this head coach and me and Murray are the future together here in Arizona. So I think he needs to go out there and pull out a victory by all means. Do you believe he's on the hot seat? 
Um, I I wouldn't say the hot seat just yet, but I think if he loses and they don't make the playoffs, or even if they win and they still miss out on the playoffs, I think he's going to be on the hot seat heading into next year. Billy, final thoughts? What about Bill Belichick? The GOAT. Look at what he's done lately. And this guy, prove it wasn't Brady. Last year, he said he lost to Miami. Uh, wasn't it, is that the rest of the division closing the gap here? They're currently coming off two consecutive losses to AFC East opponents, 22 to 12 at Miami, and a 30, 38 to 9 throttle. We watched last week at home against the Bills and MVP candidate Josh Allen. Finally traveled to New York and took a 10 point lead into the fourth quarter against them last time they played with Joe Flacco under center. If he starts losing these games, is this division closing the gap on him? And then the conversation modes and shifts to, was it more Brady than Belichick? Right. All right, so we're going to switch gears for a little New Year's <laughs> question. Last thing about 2020, after we, we got to talk about that horrible year one more time, what athlete for any sport was the MVP of 2020? Uh I'm going to have to say Mahomes. I mean, Super Bowl win, $500 million contract, which is absolutely unheard of. This team, I think, has, like, one loss in, like, their last, like, 20-something games, which is, like, this goes beyond even what Tom Brady did in New England. Like, it's just unheard of. So, without a doubt, I think I got to go with my boy, Patty Mahomes. Billy? Yeah, I'm right there with you, man. The one loss in the whole calendar year, the huge contract, winning a Super Bowl for a team that hasn't even been to a Super Bowl in 50 years, and most of us really just counted out, even when they were really good, as not being a legitimate Super Bowl contender. Look at what he did in the playoffs last year. And to your point earlier here in my notes, Brandon, he's kind of doing what we saw Steph Curry do in the NBA, where he's changing the way kids grow up playing quarterback and trying to play this position because the way he's doing it is just so polarizing. They want the haircut. We're throwing no-look passes. We're doing everything thing that Mahomes does and I just feel like he's changing the game and the way we look at and grade the quarterback position all by himself. I could agree it's Pat Mahomes but I'll make the argument for LeBron James and here's why. The nature the nature of the sport a basketball player is more valuable and more important to a team than a quarterback or a football player is to a football. It's just the way it is. A basketball player plays both sides of the floor. Once you get to the postseason you're probably playing for at least 42 out of the 48 minutes and football, you're playing one out of three sides. Yes, three sides. Plays offense, does not play defense, does not play special teams. Let's not try to pretend special teams is not important. That's the wrong. Number two, let's look at the circumstances that we've dealt with in 2020. LeBron was and probably entering his best stretch of the season right before the suspension of the season. When he was when he what he was doing since the All Star break up until the suspension of the season, he was the league MVP at that point. That's where he was making his last hurrah to get league MVP. But in that stretch, he looked like he kicked it up to playoff mode. And once you have a five month layoff, with that whole time, people had no we no one knew if the season was going to resume or not. There was getting a a, a real thought that the season was just that the season was going to end and nobody was going to crown a champion. And when you take five months off and then get back into it. You look at that as another offseason. So being in year 17, having five months off, look at his comeback as year 18, having to get back in shape, going into an environment that we've never seen in sports before. And like I already said earlier in the show, he's used to playing with thousands of packed arenas of nationally televised games, his high school games packed, the cameras on him all the time, the spotlight, the spotlight, the spotlight. And now there's no crowd entering this bubble. And then five months off, get back in shape. And we know LeBron has a custom of taking it easy in the regular season, taking his foot off the gas, coast by. And then once the playoff comes, he activates what they call, quote, unquote, zero dark 30, right? So then with that being said, there was eight regular season games in a bubble. And then the playoffs came. And doing it with a storied franchise of the Los Angeles Lakers, who have, and talk about pressure, if he doesn't deliver a championship with the Lakers with title expectations, which there was really no team that had a fighter's chance to beat them, and the way he played throughout those playoffs, winning finals MVP, being the first player in NBA history with three finals MVPs with three different franchises, doing it with the Lakers, doing it for Kobe, had to carry the burden and extra pressure of the passing of the great Kobe Bryant, rest in peace. So with that being said, in terms of Value, even though Mahomes, I believe, is a better quarterback than LeBron is a basketball player as of right now, as of the 2020 calendar year, in terms of value, you could probably give it to LeBron. 
I, in a way, got to disagree because I think Mahomes went through more to reach peak performance than LeBron. You know, coming into the NBA season, we all knew that the Lakers were the favorite. And if the Lakers didn't make the finals, then we would all be shocked. The Chiefs going into playoffs were not the favorite at all. It was the Ravens. They never played the Ravens, though. Right. You could could say the same thing with the NBA, though. You could say that the Clippers were the favorites over the Lakers, and they never played each other. No, the the Lakers were definitely the favorites, without a doubt. We all knew that that LeBron was probably going to end up in the finals unless the Clippers somehow beat them. So we all thought they were going to end up in the Western Conference finals and that the Lakers would win. But it goes without saying is that even in the playoffs, like Mahomes, like how many times were the Chiefs down by two touchdowns or three possessions and they came back and they found a way to win, even in the Super Bowl. And then he went on and did it. Then he goes down and he signs a $500 million contract, right? Now you need to go out there and, you know, basically show that you're worth $500 million. Like that's unheard. We've never seen – Five hundred million dollars given to one person before, not in any sport, even in baseball, where you get the richest contracts of all time. Nobody has even sniffed around five hundred million. So, Mike Trout, four hundred thirty million, getting there. Yeah, yeah, and that's Mike freaking Trout. And yeah. Patrick Mahomes blew by that by seventy million. Like seventy yeah. million. You know what seventy million gets you? A bench player in the NBA. I'll, like, I'll, I'll take it. Okay. Yeah, like crazy to like it's nuts to think of. And then he comes into 2020 and he loses one game, one game throughout the whole year. Like it's just it's just so on her. And I think Mahomes did this. Now I know the Chiefs are 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 a historic franchise and whatnot, but he did this in a small market in Kansas City. And now we see Patrick Mahomes everywhere. I was watching the Arizona Bowl yesterday. This guy was on three commercials in a row for three different sponsors. It was um, State Farm, um, I think like Gillette or something like. This guy is everywhere. That's all we see his face. Supposedly, and, supposedly he got twenty thousand, twenty five thousand votes for president too. Supposedly, yeah, like this is what I'm saying. Twenty twenty was definitely the year of Patrick Mahomes, and now everybody's going to go out and try to find the next Patrick Mahomes. And Brandon, how many times have you sit here and said that Patrick Mahomes is already the greatest quarterback in in, in, in NFL history? Town, town, twice he is. Yeah, I, I, I would say Pat Mahomes, but for a show to debate, I could absolutely give the argument for LeBron because in terms of if, if you're looking at a better calendar year, Mahomes had a better calendar year. So yeah, well, he, he he twenty valuable, most valuable means valuable, not necessarily the better like better player. Like Mahomes is a better quarterback than LeBron is a basketball player who had a better 2020 calendar year, but in terms of value. It's hard to talk value with LeBron given the circumstances, what he has to do as a basketball player, the reliabilities he has to bring the ball up, orchestrate the offense, score, assist, rebound, defend, build chemistry, lead. All right. that is a consideration in terms of the word uh, valuable. All right, time, out. time out. So you bring up the word valuable. Do you think in your mind that Chad Henney would be – no. The quarterback of the Chiefs we're and Nick, go one Nick pick Mahomes did. Do you think Chad Henney would be close? Do you think right, but it's it's valuable. Valuable. that's a valuable that's what Mahomes that's how valuable Mahomes yeah, is. is. Chad Henney to go and go do a Mahomes. Like what Mahomes is doing, I we we've never seen before in no history. Yeah, that's, like, that's, like saying, that's like saying could Joe Schmo from Walmart go take LeBron's point guard spot from twenty eight uh, uh, twenty twenty and the Lakers still win the championship. All I would have to do is just feed Anthony Davis. Listen, throughout the Lakers playoff run, I know the media really gassed up all their opponents because it's the anti LeBron movement. But did, did you did we really think LeBron was going to lose to Portland? No, I mean, people did. People did believe that. Let's That's the thing because they're all anti LeBron. If there was no anti LeBron, they would you know they were going to be Portland. Portland's not that good. They were going to be Portland. Then they go on and they play who? I, I don't even remember. Houston. Houston. There, there, were, there were certain somebody guaranteeing Houston victories. I'll just throw that out there. Uh, not me, but there were those people. It's the same narrative within the NBA. The same teams and the same players always come up short. That's why in the NBA, we already know what the finals is. Listen, we, we can sit here right now, January 1st, 2021, and say, hey, the finals is probably going to be Lakers Nets. And if it doesn't happen, something ca- catastrophic it m- might happen that, that we don't get to Lakers Nets. That's right? 
That's Here's one thing I have for you. <laughs> NFL. I'm just what just one more. Whereas on the NFL, yes, the Chiefs might be the favorite right now, but you can make the case for Green Bay, the Saints. Mate, mate, uh, all right, don't don't push it now. No, you can't. No, you can't. Don't push it. I'm I'm, I'm with you. Some of these, but don't push it. The, the Chiefs are the clear favorites. Don't do that. Right. But- to make the case. No, you can't. No, you can't. Oh. You, you, literally cannot, you literally cannot make a case. The Vegas uh, – I mean, if you want to go by Vegas odds, it's not even close. It's like Chiefs plus 180, Packers like plus 700. So don't No, well, the Packers are now plus 500, and the Packers got the MVP, who we didn't think Rodgers would, would win the MVP three weeks ago, and now and now he's a favorite. For about that real quick, the MVP is cursed, and the MVP doesn't ever win the championship. That's just something. But, Billy, I want to let you go. So you kind of not in a, not too bad, but in a way, kind of diminished the quarterback position as not being as effective as a single basketball player playing both sides of the ball and all that. So I'll raise you this question: Do your Jets have a Super Bowl if they have any quarterback better than Mark Sanchez that season? I mean, you can't play the F game. I I, I don't know. I, I always said that. I always said that Sanchez was their liability that season. I think it's their whole offense would change. It's you can't like the what if game. Like you can't really play the F game. In the words of Carl Collins, we don't deal with this. We deal with that. <laughs> We've so, seen really, really good NFL teams struggle. Just right, to- right. Their whole offense, like a, with a better quarterback, their whole offense had to change. Because like we said earlier in the show, Rex Ryan's game plan was ground and pound play defense. With a better quarterback, that game plan changes. Maybe it helps them, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, he wasn't great in that AFC championship game. The one against the Colts his rookie year, I mean, they were up 17-6. I started pinching myself like, yo, the Jets may go to the Super Bowl. And then reality, well, Peyton Manning drove down the field within 50 seconds. And I realized, all right, the Jets are up 17-13 at half, but I know they're going to lose at that point. I gave up at halftime. And then against the Steelers, when they were down 24 nothing, they made it interesting. But the dysfunctional Jets, you know what? Actually, I'm going to say no. Even if they had a better quarterback, they wouldn't have won. Why? Because they're the New York Jets and dysfunctional franchises find a way to lose and always will find a way to disappoint you. That is so true. I, the question, I am right. No, they wouldn't. There you go. That's how I answer that question. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. That's going to wrap up today. Uh, I want to thank both of you guys for joining me. Always fun to talk some sports with you guys. Billy, if you want to shout out your uh, podcast. Yeah. Check me out. Uh, Belly Up Fantasy Live Wednesday evening with the Belly Up team. We run down each matchup every week, give you some starts, some sits, uh, guys to play, things to be aware of, and uh, just kind of break down the whole week's slates of games each week. We've got a lot of stuff going on this offseason uh, leading into fantasy draft season. It'll be a lot of interesting stuff for us, and we're bringing a lot of new people to Belly Up, so we've got a lot of great content coming out, so come check us out. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining me again. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks for having you're, you're, you're listening to the Worldwide Sports Radio Network.